Okay, so with Now's help, we got this uh, very powerful after effect, right? Because last time some of you had trouble seeing the after effect. You probably didn't believe me. Now let's see whether this one works. Lights off. So what you should do is fixate the cars in the middle for 10, 15 seconds. And when Elvis appears, you see him? <laughs> see, isn't it striking? This is gray. Here, we can do it again. No, I first, I didn't, I, 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 when I first saw this many years ago, I said, I don't understand, where was the illusion? It's colors. <laughs> when in fact, there were no colors. So this is the original. Now, may, you also may want to notice, what. remember, red, blue, green, yellow, just remember that. Red, blue, green, yellow. And you notice it waxes and wanes? But then it comes back, yeah. So in fact, you can do it so... St I mean, what you can now do, you can now go back and forth. And at some point... Um, yeah, no, it is, because at some point you can arrange it. I'm not sure I can do it here. That, that you cannot tell after, after a while. I mean, you know, of course, which is real now. But after, sorry, after a while, the effect becomes so compelling that it really looks... that this, the colors are as vibrant... Yeah, I mean, isn't this amazing? But in fact, there's, there are just no colors there. Okay. Yeah, I agree. That, 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 well, we, we can look at that again. It's a little bit strange. Yeah, yeah, I know. So does everybody see the after effect on the right? It's more or less the same. Yeah. 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 Almost. Well, if they're not here in the first place, they're not very distinguishable. In, so I think that's the main problem. Yeah. So you can there games and you can sort of play. We used to do well. We do that, I guess, in the vision class. You can do all sorts of interesting things with these after effects. Anyhow, the, I mean, you can use them, although I don't know anybody has used color after effects to, to look at, um, you know, neurons that respond, that, that express the NCC for color, right? You can, you can ask where the neurons that respond to color that express the after image that's physically not there, but the neurons still fire, and so they still convey the sense of seeing, a, you know, a hue or pastel color. Where are those? Nobody's done that yet for color. In general, for reasons I don't fully understand, um, probably just having to do with the organization of the brain, there's less of a... It's more di difficult to find specific loci in the brain that respond to, um, to color. It's very easy to do for motion, as, as we'll see today. And it seems to be fairly easy for stereo, but not as easy for, for color. Okay. So we'll, we'll cram, there's no lecture, uh, tomorrow I'm going to Stanford, um, and so there's no lecture on Friday, so we'll cram two lectures into, into today and save ourselves a lecture on Friday. Okay, so we'll talk first about, uh, about some principles of cortical architecture. If you want to understand the uh, brain and consciousness, you have to understand cortex, since cortex is, after all, where ma most of the specific action happens. In other words, we, we think, well, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that all the specific representation of, of color or pain or um, hearing or words and all the specific action and specific memory uh, representation are laid down in cortical structures. And in general, this doesn't have to be true, but it seems to be true in biology. In fact, it's probably true for any evolved, highly evolved system, including 
you know, some modern computer architectures, they, they were structure, structure and function are intimately related. So the idea is if you want to understand a function, you should look at, you should look at and understand st uh, structure, try, try to differentiate structure, there, there's relationship between the two. It doesn't have to be, right? You can assume that there's some sort of universal Turing machine architecture, architecture, and it's everywhere exactly the same. There is no difference in the, in the, um, in the structure because it's a universal architecture and it performs everywhere the same function. But biology doesn't work like that. And it probably has to do with the fact that it's a highly evolved system. You seem to have uh, um, lots of highly specialized structure that, that analyze specific um, uh, uh, functions. Now that's also beginning to be true to a certain extent if you look at a CPU, right? You've got a, you've got a bus, you've got memory, you've got the CPU itself, you've got cache one, you've got cache two, you've got the ALU. Uh, so you, you're also beginning, and the, the more um, highly designed the machine is, the more optimized it is for in terms of power consumption, etc. the more you can see these structure function relationships. Many people have, many clinicians, this is, it started off at the turn of last century, many clinicians, but later on pure neuroscientists, have tried to sort of to make maps of the human, <coughs> human cerebral cortex. The very, various version of these maps in existence, the one that's proven to be um, historically the most influential is this due to Brodmann. Brodmann was a German uh, who worked in between the war, well, before the wars and uh, around the Great War, 19... 10, 1920, he worked in Berlin. He worked mainly in humans, but also in, in monkeys, and I think in, yeah, and in other animals. And uh, based on uh, he, of course, what he had available at his time was a microscope and some simple stains, like, like particularly the one of Golgi, and uh, some myelin stains. So they could also look at myelin. Remember, myelin is sort of the, um, the insulation sheet of axons. And so the white matter is white. That's mainly myelin, what you see there. And it serves to speed up um, the propagation of action potentials. And sort of using, by, by today's measure, a relatively simple um, technique, they did what's called cytoarchitectonics. Cyto is, is cell, and architectonics is obvious. So they try to differentiate cortical tissue based on the organization of cells, what cells are present, on subtle changes in texture based on the types of cells that are present. And again, the belief driving these people were, was the fact that there are differences in cellular architecture. They probably reflect differences in function. And by and large, that, that's been proven to be prophetic. That's been proven to be true. So Brodmann, as I said, is the most influential. It's still used in most textbooks today. You hear people say Brodmann area 17, for example, that's primary visual cortex, or Brodmann area 4, uh, that's sort of part of, um, of motor cortex, or Brodmann area 44, that's part of Broca area, the speech area. What he did, he, he um, now there's no simple principle why they're called 17, 18, 19, 20. Essentially, he ordered them in the way he, um, in the way he studied them. They're also non-contiguous. There are four, I think there's a gap. There are four numbers that are missing for various historical reasons. People have wondered about. But uh, so altogether, there are 50, well, they're on the order of 50 areas. I think it goes up to 52, but like I said, four or five numbers are missing. Um, now, so you can see the front, the back. Here's primary visual cortex, area 17. This is the Kalsvin Fisher. Remember, I said, this is sort of, if you unfold it, this is the credit card at the back of your head and the medial uh, wall. And um, outside of area 17 is extra side area called area 18 and 19. Now, you should not be misled into, Joe Bogan makes a point in, in his class about this. One should not be misled by looking at this. This is, um, um, if you look at these borders, they're not geometric borders. They're not incredible fine. So if you look at maybe at the, they might exist at the level of one or two millimeter, but if you go down further, you can see invagination, you can see transitional territories, they're not very clean. So the, there are a few clean borders. The best one is between 17 and 18, and there's also a relatively clean border at area four, which is sort of motor cortex, pre and post central. But most of the other areas are anything but clean. And um, just like, poly, you know, if you look at maps of most countries, with except, remarkable exception of the U.S., but certainly, for example, if you look at the Middle East, or you look at Europe over the last 100 years, you see sort of countries fuse and fission, and you also see that today, not so much fusion, but mainly fission. You see a lot of fission here, in the sense that people with modern methods recognize that an area that used to be homo sort of homogeneous, because we didn't have any better tools, now turns out to be actually composed of three or four or five, six different areas. 
that's uh, that's very common. Some of those areas might might sort of um, might uh, uh, occur across some of these earlier Bartman areas. So Bartman areas should be used as a very very rough guide. It's not it's not the gospel. Yeah. Um, so, people with modern methods of neuroanatomy, they have better dyes, or they have many more dyes. They also have metabolic dyes available. In other words, dyes that stain for the um, for metabolic active, uh, active tissue, or dyes that stain for the presence of various other chemical components. Dyes that stain specifically for various proteins. And you might, you know, you might wonder why is all of that relevant. It just turns out that if you use some of these dyes, many of course not, but some of them, they de uh, sort of de de delineate specific compartments. And it turns out the neurons in those compartments do very specific things. So, for example, recently what was disco discovered that in the LGN, so that intermediate relay station between the retina and primary visual cortex, there are neurons that stain for this one protein it's called calcium calmodian dependent protein kinase 2. And those neurons seem to specifically involved in mediating uh, the sense of blue yellow. So, uh, they transmit blue yellow information. And um, so it's unclear. I mean, nobody knows at this point why this protein is, uh, is, is localized within these neurons, but it, they are. That's a fact. And so A, that tells you, if you look at that, that tells you, so any time you find such a difference, it tells you, well, there's probably a difference in function. And B, using now molecular, modern molecular biology techniques, you can then exploit that. and and sort of design magic bullets, design, if you want, viral, or design other sort of molecular syringes, disposable molecular syringes, if you want, that can maybe specifically target those, those neurons and turn them on and off. And so you can take a normal person or a normal animal and then just turn off all the neurons that, that are involved in, the blue, uh, in, in blue yellow. And so then you can make the jump from, from correlation, from mere observing the system, to actually interfering, to perturbing the system, to, to causation. Now, um, as you'll see in a second, well, I can sort of glimpse, show you a glimpse. So modern, modern methods have revealed lots and lots and lots and lots of different cortical areas. So this is the, uh, it's a very famous picture from uh, Dan Fellow and David Van Essen, who used to be here at Caltech for many years. And um, so this is just the different areas in the visual system of a macaque, which occupies on the order of 35 to 40% something like that of all cortical tissue is dedicated to visual perception or visual motor function. In us, it's a bit less. It's, um, it's maybe a third, uh, a quarter, 25%, 28%. So a lot of vision, a lot of cortex is given over to vision, most of which, of course, proceeds in the total absence of, of, of any conscious inter, uh, interception and, or intercession, right? As we emphasize many times, you're just uh, conscious of the result. So the, the part of, co uh, of cortex that's, that's, that underlies things that you actually consciously represent or that you do like thinking is probably a very small fraction, certainly much less than, than 30%. Anyhow, so it starts here at the bottom, retinal ganglion cells in the retina, and there are these two compartments I mentioned, Magna and Parvocellar neurons, corresponding to sort of, uh, and there are some other, lots of other ones that, we, that, that don't show up here. This is not a complete picture. Right? These are neurons that tend to respond to um, they tend to be selective to rapid to changes to high temporal frequency and low spatial frequency. They don't seem to care a lot about color. Well, these neurons seem to care a lot about either high spatial detail, and they also care about wavelength selective information. And then this is the LGN, then it goes into V1, and from V1 it goes into all these other areas, V2, V3, VP. They have all these funny abbreviations, some of them Latin, some of them English, some of them idiosyncratic where you have in England on the continent, different nomenclature. Uh, you might see that if you read in the homework, like this area, I'll talk quite a bit about today, area MT, middle temple area, it's very often also called V5 for various idiosyncratic historic reasons. Up there is hippocampus and entorhinal cortex. That's sort of the, um, if you, if you draw a map of, of the areas and you, 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 you ask the question, where is the most distal area, distal both from the input and from the output? Where is the area that's most removed from the input and the area that's most removed from the output? Uh, you know, you'll end, up, uh, you'll end up something in, um, in, in hippocampus. Of course, this architecture doesn't end there. It goes all these areas that go on further, either down, either they project directly to output structures or they go on further to the front of the brain. 
But uh, so you can see the trouble is you've got all these areas, let's see, 40 areas in vision so far, and people might discover more as they find finer and finer distinction. How can you think of them? How can you arrange them? Are they randomly connected? Is it, is it a random graph? Is there some sort of hierarchy? Is there a circular structure? So um, people discovered uh, anatomists, Kathy Rockland and Panya, um, Panya and um, some other anatomists discovered that if you look at if you look at the detailed patterns of the wiring of the uh, projection systems within cortex, you'll see you can that at least in the back part of the brain. So the back part of the brain, I mean, crudely everything that extends from the central sulcus backwards. Right? You have this big central sulcus that runs down here into the sylvian fissure, and that divides the brain into front part and into back part. Very crudely spoken, and the back part is cum granosal is concerned with perception in all its guises visual perception, auditory perception, some other sensory perception. Well, the front part roughly is concerned with action, with motor action and, and planning, etc. So in the back part, what, what people discovered that there seems to be that you can classify projections into different types. That um, there seems to be one dominant type that can be of either two forms, two versions, so either, um, uh, either the neurons, let me see, um, Either the neurons uh, sit in the upper, so remember, uh, I emphasize, it's very important to understand where neurons sit in, in which layer they are, they are organized. Now it turns out, now you'll see why it's important. So they are sort of conventionally people in most cortical areas divide a cortex into six, although you can divide it into many more. If you want to be a little bit crude about it, you can say, well, there are really three cortical uh, layering. There's the superficial layer. There's the intermediate layer, layer four, that's the zone, that's usually where the input comes into, and then there's deep layer, layer five and six. And so if you, uh, if you adopt this tripartite division, then you can see there's one type of projection that originates in the superficial layer, two and three, that projects into the, uh, in the next area, in, into its postsynaptic target, into the middle, into the input layer, layer four. Sometimes, sometimes you can have neurons that sit either in the upper, in the upper layers or in the lower layers that both project into into the next stage, into layer four. And this, you can think of a forward connection. This is a feed-forward connection. You can think of a feed-forward connection. Because what I'm going to tell you now, it turns out if you, if you classify um, all the axonal projections in this way, based on where there's cell body and where's the site of termination, then it turns out cortex is not a random collection of regions, but seems to have a hierarchical structure. There's a hierarchy there. And then hierarchy is very important because now you can now you can define that allows you to define and that say that area X is above area um, area uh, you know W and below area Y. Now there are lots of exceptions, although we are not sure whether those uh, those exceptions are random or whether they have a function. And very often uh, sort of um, neuron skip a layer, projection skip a layer. So you might go from from uh, you know from from layer two uh, from sort of uh, neurons at stage two directly into stage four. So anyway, so uh, so there's these, you can define a feed forward connections. You can also define a feedback connection. So they usually sit in in lower layers, layer five and six and project into another area, and they avoid uh, the um, immediately and seem to mainly project into the upper areas. These are the ax, the synaptic terminals, right? So these are the, where the axons terminate, and sometimes also into the lower layers. And that seems to be a back connection. That seems to be a feedback, feedback connections. And then there are some sideways connections. Now this, this high key, this was then formalized by John Manzel when he was here for his PhD, and, and then, um, um, extended by John Mundell and formalized by these people. So they took these rules and applied them to the visual system, and then by and large they can define this visual hierarchy. It looks a bit like a steam plant. Well, you have, you know, 12, 14 levels. It's somewhat indeterminate since for, you know, if you do graph theoretical, you know, if you just think of those as graphs and those as nodes, and the nodes are directed now because you can define a feed-forward and feedback connections. Um, you can, of course, always define a, a hierarchy with more levels, but if you sort of impose some constraints such as minimal numbers of, uh, of levels, you arrive at something like this, which has, I don't know, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, well, 14 layers, something like that. The point is it's not so important whether they're 12 or 14. The important is that, by and large, it seems to be a hierarchy um, where you can, define, you can say this area is probably is above this area and vice versa. 
uh, and the hope is that this will ultimately cause us to, uh, lead to a better understanding. Right now, this is um, right now. I think, the, by and large, the majority of people accept the majority of anatomists and physiologists accept that there is a hierarchy. Although there's still certain elements of it is controversial. Is it a unique hierarchy? There seem to be a number of exceptions. Are those exceptions are they there by design, or is it just you know like you know is it just a, are those just random exception? And um, uh, why do you really need such a hierarchy? I mean, humans like we like to think of hierarchies because most of you know if you look around in in, in organization in you know in our lives, in our families, in our universities, in our armies, you everywhere have organization, and of course it makes management of people much easier. It's a little bit less clear why why natural structures such as this have to have um, have to have hierarchy. People who study such things, organizational schemes, again argue that it's the nature of any complex hierarchical evolved system that it has to have hierarchies because it makes evolution it makes evolution of complex system um, possible. If there's no hierarchy, the, the argument goes it's very impossible to it's very difficult to evolve truly large and complex systems without having um, hierarchies that you can recur onto. Okay, the visual system is a hierarchy. Now, um, one thing I have to note, the hierarchy is not necessarily reflected in activation times. What I mean by that is the following. If you shine a light into the retina down here, then you can, you can look at what, what we call a net wave. You have this wave, this wave front of action potential that moves through the system. It is not true that you know, it moves through the system that this area will always get activity before any area here, will always get activity in any area here. The analogy is a little bit like an interstitial tide pool, right? You have the surf and you have the, the rocks and you have this interstitial pool and sometimes depending on the wave and depending on the depth of the sand and, and other considerations, you get, you know, one sort of uh, one part of the wave advances way over here but it sort of hasn't really come that far and, and another part of the shore and likewise here. Because these neurons, are these magnocellar neurons, and they uh, seem to, they, they, uh, as I mentioned, they, they like transit information. They also signal information much quicker than, than the power cell and neurons. So if you just put an electrode in and you flash a light on, typically you see these neurons responding much earlier than these neurons. And there seem to be speedways. So, for example, if you go from this pathway from V1 into an area called MT into the FEF, frontal eye field, which is already part in the frontal part of the brain, that's a very rapid connection. Well, some other connection like this one from here down to V4, down to infratemporal cortex seems to be a slower one. It seems to be more 160, 140 milliseconds while you can get to MC and to frontal eye field within 60 milliseconds, something like that, 60 milliseconds. So it does not mean, the psyche does not mean that you have sort of, you know, that it's a clock thing that the input moves here at one, at one you know, sort of one, one stage per beat of the clock. It doesn't work like that. Okay, another uh, principle of cortical organization uh, that seems to be true, this is mainly for vision. The previous hierarchy, people have, attempt, by far more is known about vision than about uh, touch and audition. But people have made similar hierarchies now for some other sensory uh, domain and for the auditory domain. And the claim is that you likewise there have hierarchies. So it's not something just unique to vision, but possibly to all sensory processing with olfaction always playing a special role. It's an evolutionary much older system. The cortex there is much older also, and it bypasses the thalamus and a number of other differences. So olfaction is always, uh, always an exception. Just as an aside, how many of you have ever dreamt that you smell in your dreams? So you do smell. Okay. Because there's one claim that because there's no direct primary connection, so in, in vision you have, you go from retina to the thalamus to, to a cortex, also true for some other sensory and for auditory. It's not true for olfaction. There you first go to olfactory cortex and then you go down to another part of the thalamus. And some people have claimed that might be the reason why most people don't dream of smells, but it's obviously not true in five of you. Well, I guess, uh, so I mean, 
so during dreams, of course, during sleep, your eyes are closed. There's no input coming from the retina, and the entire thalamus is in a different state. Depends on what. It's usually not in a relay state. Yes, so it, it doesn't pass along sensory information, partly because there is no sensory information. Depending what state of sleep you are, it can be in one of these different oscillatory s states. So I don't know anybody who's done your sort of experiment, the one you suggested. There's been claim of unconscious olfactory discrimination, similar to blindsight. But when I looked at it, the data was never terrible convincing. Um, okay, so in, in the visual domain, that's, this might be something that's unique to vision. There's another organizing principle. This was first discerned based on clinical, this goes back to 1910s or 1920s, based on clinical damage, patterns of clinic, uh, clinical damage. Um, so neurology really grew tremendously at the turn of the century, last century, partly because of the existence of high-speed rifles that penetrated right through the skull and right through the, um, uh, through the um, brain and went out the other end and gave rise sometimes, to, unfortunately, to lots of people who had injuries. And some of them were rather specific. And because the bullet left, it didn't stay inside the cortex and you know, um, ricocheted around and made huge damage. Sometimes they made very specific damage. And so some of the earliest uh, work that we know, modern work that we know about the brain, is brain damage in patients from the um, Japanese-Russian um, War, 1906, Sevastopol, I think, and um, uh, the First World War, of course. And so what people uh, uh, there found for, that there seemed to be di patterns, distinct patterns of, of injury relating to specific type of behavioral deficits. So people define a ventral and a dorsal system. So ventral is stomach, ventre, if you speak French, and dorsal, do is a back. You can re remember it very easily if you speak French. So there seem to be a ventral and a dorsal system. So the ventral system, also sometimes called vision for perception, or the what systems, starts in primary visual cortex and then goes down here. Goes down here into passes into before and then infratemporal cortex, posterior infratemporal cortex, caltech and anterior infratemporal cortex. This stands for central infratemporal cortex. There's also somewhere in MIT, yeah, medial, uh, I think it's just around there. Anyhow, um, um, so this is, and from here the information then goes on to lateral prefrontal cortex. And this, if you have damage here, now this is cum granulosalis, if you have damage here in, in humans, the, the typical deficit is that they have, for example, inability to see faces or their various object agnosia, that they're unable, there's nothing wrong with their eyes, but they're unable to recognize or identify objects, or they've lost the, the ability to recognize things that are, you know, independent of distance or independent of size or things like that. So this is called the what system or the vision for perception pathway, that the, the vision you need to actually perceive things consciously is impaired to various extent. It's a second pathway called the, this is the, vent, the ventral, it's the second pathway called the dorsal pathway because it goes on the, the back side of the brain, the, the, the right, dorsal, uh, that goes from posterior parietal, from primary visual cortex to posterior parietal cortex in and around the area of the interparietal sulcus, the one that Richard Anderson and his, and his colleagues and students study, and from then goes also to the lateral prefrontal cortex. So here's sort of those two streams reconverge to a certain extent. Here the typical pattern deficit is neglect that we'll talk about later or that you're unable to, that patients are unable to localize things in space, that they have deficit, they, for example, they cannot reach anymore, there's nothing wrong with the motor system, they can see things, but they're unable to connect, you know, to, to know where things are relative to other things, and they have they, they difficulty precisely reaching out and grabbing. They'll do consistent, you know, they, they're unable to grab this, they make consistent errors. And this is called the, the wear system, because if you look at it in monkeys, in this homologue system, in monkeys there's something very similar, those neurons seem to care a great deal about where things are, about the location of things. Or it's sometimes also called perception for action, since this is the vision you need to actually act in the world, to adjust your optical flow. You know, if you move around, you have all these subtle cues about motions, you constantly adjust your body all the time, um, or to reach out and grab to make eye movements. You get deficits in, in those sort of systems. So that, that's called the vision, the, um, uh, vision for action, vision perception pathway, alternatively the ventral and dorsal stream. Okay, then lastly, I briefly wanted to mention, we won't talk about it too much, uh, much less is known about it in both humans and in, in uh, monkeys, the front part of the brain, which is fairly big. It's like 35% um, uh, or something of, of the entire cortex. This is an MR of a living person 
and uh, from Hannah Damasio's atlas. And you can see the very, I mean, those you should all know, certainly was part of the homework, the various lobes. So you have the front lobe in red, seen from the various views. So the front lobe is essentially delimited the, everything in front of the central sulcus and down the, down this, the sylvian fissure is sort of the front, the front lobes. And then the back lobe is, of course, the occipital, uh, um, occipital lobe. Lobe just means sort of large part of the brain. Uh, sometimes there's an old-fashioned lobule, it's also sometimes called. Then you have the, the temporal lobe down here, then you have the parietal lobe down uh, sort of ab above here. Now the frontal lobe themselves are conventionally divided into at least three parts. And the, the frontal lobe is really, the frontal lobes are really uniquely what makes us humans, if you can say that. I mean, sort of anathema to a biologist in some sense. But if you really look at sort of the things like speech that make us unique human or sort of high, you know, symbolic processing ability, mathematics, invention of Ma Macintosh and other things, those are all due crudely to parts of our frontal lobe, particular prefrontal cortex. So the great, the great aim of the frontal lobes is action. And at various time scales. So one part of the frontal lobe, the one that's best, easiest uh, def to define, is the motor strip, motor cortex. Runs pretty much on top of here. You can identify this yourself if you're volunteers in, for example, in um, transcranial magnetic stimulation experiments like Shinshimoto in his lab is done. Then you put this, this coil, this magnetic coil above your, let's see, above your motor strip. And if you have it at the right location and you trigger, so you briefly have a current through it, generates a brief magnetic pulse that somehow interferes. We don't understand the biophysics of it yet, really. But it interferes, it excites and inhibits neurons. If you do it above the motor strip, for example, on this side, everything is contralateral, or is crossed, of course, then you might, you know, you might twitch here, or, um, you know, you might twitch here, you, I mean, you, and you're going to twitch something. It doesn't really hurt, although Patrick tells me if you do it a couple thousand times, you get a big headache, right? <laughs> What? I might have oh, it's good for you. It's good for you. <laughs> Actually, it is used as a technique of last resource for uh, chronic depression. It's called a, a repetitive TMS. And so if you really, I mean, I think of it like, you know, you reboot your, your, your computer. And so I think that what happens in, in TMS. But it is used and seems to be very effective at that. And yeah, so here you, it's, it's just a single pulse. And there seems to be no, I mean, there's no damage as far, as far as we can tell. And it excites. It's a great technique for interfering with the brain, albeit it's very crude. That's a trouble from a neuroscientific point of view. You're probably activating, you know, we talk maybe a fraction of a cent, you know, you're activating structures for a fraction of a centimeter. So if you remember the cubic millimeter, the 100,000 cells, you know, we, we are probably, we might be talking about a million of neurons that you affect here. Anyhow, so if you do it over the motor, that's the, the, the motor representation. So there you have most of the output, not all, but most of the output in layer five, the output structure, remember, layer five, the, the, the pyramidal cells that project down that make up the pyramidal pathway that go down to the spinal cord that ultimately make you do things. Then there is premotor cortex, and then there is prefrontal cortex proper, which is usually defined by as a recipient area of a, a specific thalamic nucleus. So you move from, uh, so as I said, the great aim of, of the frontal lobes is action. So here you move from very specific action, you know, a specific um, uh, set of muscles very rapidly in the next 50 milliseconds. As you move forward here, and this is the front, this is the back of the brain. As you move forward, you move to um, the brain is, uh, is involved in actions that are more and more distant. So, you know, if you want to do a long-term plan and see how do I get from here to out of this, out of this um, building, that's sort of, you know, it's a whole sequence that would involve, you know, probably prefrontal lobe. While, you know, if I'm just getting ready, people have done this, for example, if I'm thinking about playing soccer, if I'm thinking of playing, um, you know, of kicking a ball or climbing or something, then part of the, in, in the premotor cortex would be involved. These are also, as I mentioned, the ones, the parts of the brain that make us uniquely human. So if you have lesions here, you get all sorts of deficits in moral reasoning, in, in social judgments, inability to uh, come to any sort of decision. You know, typical people who prevaricate, you know, who you know, cannot make up their mind, you know, in the, when talking about a menu in a restaurant or a life decision, usually that sort of thing all involves, uh, I mean, frontal lobe dysfunctions. Quite a bit is known at this clinical level about frontal lobe dis lung, uh, dysfunctions, uh, either through uh, strokes that people have in the frontal part of the brain or through benign uh, tumors or, or, or malignant tumors. 
those patients usually don't survive for that long to study, but to benign tumors that, that, uh, that require the excision of a part of the, of the frontal lobes. And of course, you also have Bocca's area here, area 44, so that you, for most of us, for all right-handed, it's going to be in the left, and for most left-handed, it's also going to be in the left lobe. Um, here, area 40. Um, it's, it's up there. This is historically very interesting. It's named Broca after a French neurologist who uh, taught at the Salpetri in Paris. And it was sort of one of the founding um, hours of modern neurology or modern neuroscience since uh, he'd observed this patient, Broca's patient, for many years and came to the conclusion that this person had an aphasia. So he was unable, he was unable to have fully formed languages. He could still sort of utter things, but he couldn't really speak in any sort of language, in any sort of, of, uh, of uh, he had no syntax, couldn't really form any, any, any real words and sentences. And uh, there wasn't anything, um, he could understand language. Of course, he can also have uh, difficulty with understanding language. And then when he died and they, they, they did an, um, um, a post-mortem, they found, they found a tumor, I think, I can't remember, a tumor or a stroke, I think a tumor, a benign tumor, I can't remember. They found a, a deficit in that particular part of the brain. And then for, for, for the first time that sort of, or, or that really established sort of a very nice link between I mean, hypothesized, of course, was only one patient, but then other people did this and found more patient between a function, namely the expression of, of, of words and language, and a specific location in the brain. Of course, then the next step is that people discovered the motor strip, uh, you know, in, in dogs, I think, where they stimulated the open skull of dogs and could evoke various actions depending on where, where, uh, where they stimulated. This came all before, uh, before people know about the specific location of uh, vision. That's why Broca's area is uh, rightfully named after, after Dr. Broca and is, uh, plays such an important part. Now, even in monkeys, by the way, or even in chimps, you see a homologue of Broca's area. It's not that this is a total new area, but it seems even it's in monkeys you can find it. And in monkeys, it has to do with uh, fine motor coordination of hands or lips. So you can, um, and possibly vocalization. So you can see how it evolved. It didn't, you know, like anything, there was a precursor there. It's not a sort of deus ex machina, suddenly out of nothing popped this uh, language area. Okay. So that's one lecture. And I'm going to speed up. I won't. Just kidding. And I'll show you half of these slides. Um, Do you have any questions about the first part? Is the area four distinct in the prefrontal lobes? Um, the cortex, is, is there a strong mental layer that shows it? Okay, so area, so area four is part of the motor cortex. That's, distinct, that's relatively distinct because it has, you can see the, the, um, you can see the cells in, um, what are they called, um, in layer five. Um, yeah, and, and it's called a granular because it doesn't really have a very well developed layer four. It has a very thinly developed layer four. So, so that's part of how you can define motor cortex by the absence of a strong layer four. I mean, it sort of makes sense. Its main function is output. Its main function is not input. No, so it, uh, then there's a transition zone. So if you really go to prefrontal cortex, it has layer four. So layer, uh, so layer um, area six, Broadman area six is transitional where you have a poorly developed and it's called discranular cortex, I think, sort of, there's somewhat, and then if you go in front of the brain, you have, you have, uh, you have layer, you have a layer four. Yeah, and then, the, uh, then of course, there are these other specialization, for example, some parts of the frontal lobe, including the anterior cingulate, have these spindle cells that John Allman found that are unique to us. Uh, layer 5 in motor cortex has these very big cells that project all the way down to the spinal cord that provide the output. The output, I mean, the, the story see, is a, the story that you typically read uh, at first reading of many textbooks. There's this total division distinction between post and pre-central gyrus. That pre-central gyrus is sort of everything motor and post area 1, 2, 3 is somatosensory. That's not quite true. You also have cells in layer 5 that in, in, in somatosensory cortex that, uh, and that go down. It's not an all or none. But statistically, there, I mean, the vast majority of the output is in, is in area four. So, uh, I remember several students uh, asked a question about uh, hierarchical position of peripheral folliculus and also palvinar. The palvinar. Yeah, palvinar uh, palvinar. How do you 
define the you know, function of the well, so you can, um, so much less is known, so the, 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 the colliculus uh, receives input from the eye, and in, in many animals, before mammals, in other animals, outside an, uh, mammals, it seems to be the dominant, uh, or one very, very big visual centers. In, in us, it's less dominant now because we uh, evolved all the superstructure on top of it. And it, it projects to the cortex. Uh, it does project to indirectly through cortex, but there's no direct projection. It does get a direct feedback from cortex, uh, and it's involved. It seems to get input from parts of the brain that are involved in motion, probably because its prime, its big job in us seems to be in moving our eyes. Probably now, so the the thalamus is a more complicated story. That it's a big mystery right now. So thalamus is like a quail egg. And only the, the one that people know best is the LGN, the lateral genicular nucleus, that's the recipient of the output of the eye and in turn projects to prime visual cortex. It turns out to be one of the smaller visual nuclei. There are also other parts of the, other visual parts of the thalamus called the palvina, and there are four or five or six different palvina independent maps. They project to different cortical regions. Um, of, the, of the visual, so if, well, I don't want to exit this file. They project, well, they do project to some of these areas. So LGN projects uni almost uniquely into V1. Some of the other uh, palvina areas also have very strong relationship with, with one, some of these individual areas. It's a big mystery. We don't really know what the thalamus does, uh, apart from the LGN. The other big mystery is that all of these thalamic nuclei in vision and all the other modality get massive feedback. So I counted this once in a cat. It turns out there are 10 times more fibers that go back from the, from the visual brain, from the visual cortex to the LGN, than fibers from LGN to visual cortex. So it's like you have a camera and you have a CPU, and you have a coax cable going from the camera to the CPU. That makes sense. And then you have a coax cable that's three times bigger, by factor 10, that goes back from, from, the, ca from the CPU to the camera. Why does it anybody guess? People have made lots of hypotheses, including myself, about attention and gain modulation. Um, probably some of these are along the right lines. We just don't know. It's a, it's, a, it's a mystery. And so we don't, to get back to your question, we don't really understand the relationship between the various maps uh, in the thalamus, the visual maps in the thalamus, and the visual maps in cortex proper. There isn't too much, there's some work done on it, but not too much, partly because we really don't understand yet what makes those things tick and what is the specific stimuli that excites uh, um, um, a palvina. It probably has to do with uh, uh, attention. I mean, that's mine, many, many other people's guess that uh, the other th uh, salami nucleus probably have to do with regulation of, of flow through that structure. This shows you a map. Um, um, in sh compare, uh, comparison between human and monkey, can anybody tell me what is what? Which one? One of them is human and one of them is monkey. The one on the right. Which one? The one on the right is human. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're an expert. Doesn't count. Okay. The one on the right is human. The one on the left is monkey. So what was done here? You take the brain, which uh, you put people in a magnet, and you talk, you do various techniques that we're going to talk about in vision class, but not in this class. You have techniques that essentially allow you to map the visual environment in a systematic manner onto, onto the brain. And then uh, you, uh, you can image that using functional imaging where you track the hemodynamic activity. And then you can use graphic tools to map this complicated 3D structure onto a flat structure. Of course, you can't do that uniquely. You can cut that in the various ways. And there's one w way that now seems to be standard. So you have to think again where the, where the asterisk is. That's, a, that's the bottom sort of, of the calcium fissure. And remember, you've also for homework, you had to do that sort of oval that was V1. So that sort of uh, the calcium fissure is, you know, runs along here. Really need a laser pointer. And sort of the, the, think of the, the calcium fissure being cut, the, the depth of the canyon being cut and then sort of s splayed sort of like this. That's the structure you have here. Okay, if you can, you know, if you can imagine that. Um, right, so if you remember from the homework or from class, you had, um, you had sort of this retinotopic mapping, this log mapping, right, where the fovea was represented here in a, in a human, the blind spot is somewhere here. So now what you do, sort of you, you, uh, you uh, cut this here, and then you, you, know, you fold it outside. That's V1. Now next to here, you have another area. So that's called V2. 
V1, V1, V2. So this is the lower representation of, this represents the, it's the upper part of the brain representing the lower visual field and V, this lower part on the, on the lower banks of the sulcus represents the upper part of the visual field. And so here's V2 and then outside here you have an area called V3. So again, this is cut and, and you can see that here, those areas. So I'm not going to talk about the techniques of getting qu uh, qu uh, quite sophisticated how you can do these imaging techniques. And here it's sort of compared by Roger Tutel and at the MGH and his people. Uh, here you do something similar based uh, on electrophysiology. Now today you might have seen some of the, the, the talks here uh, over the last couple of weeks. Today you can also do this imaging in monkeys and directly compare them. But the bottom line is that the organization is rather similar. It's not identical. And you wouldn't expect that since, you know, we diverged like something, f um, what is it, 15 or 20 million years ago. I mean, a long time ago that we had a, uh, that we had a sort of shared a common an ancestor between, you know, uh, the macaque monkey and, um, and, and, and human. So you wouldn't expect those things to be identical, but they're rather similar. That's the, the, I mean, that's the main point. You can define similar areas that have some of the same properties. So here, what you can see, it's, a, it's, a, it's the, the same retinotopic mapping that you find in V1. You also find in other areas. And so here, you know, you, uh, you shift from the, uh, from, uh, you know, the, the uh, let's see, this is all the, uh, the upper visual field, and here you move from eccentricity from things close by to far away, and then you move continuously. There's, you know, between the various maps, there's not an abrupt discontinuity. It's continuous. You would expect that. So you continuously, as, as you move along here, you continuously move from one, at one particular angle, you move towards the, excess, uh, towards the periphery and then back again, and then again towards the periphery in these different areas. So it's a little bit like a collage, like a, you know, like a painting, let's see, an impressionist painting where you have, where the, the world is sort of is put together in these different maps. You have these multiple map uh, um, representation of the visual world. We don't really understand the existence of these different maps. I mean, they seem to be there. These maps are different. Like, for example, the grain uh, of resolution in V1 is highest compared to even the next map in V2. We don't really understand all these differences, why they exist. And there are probably many, many properties that we haven't at all, that we have no idea there. We just don't know right now. So MT is this area I'll now talk about pretty much for the rest of the class. MT or V5, that seems to be highly specialized for, for, for motion. Now, it's, it's a big, uh, there are lots of people fighting in this field about how do you name these different areas and how many different areas are there. And people write very vituperative and very nasty articles attacking each other because somebody calls this V4V and somebody else thinks it's just preposterous. It just should be called V4. I kid you not. I've had debate with these people. They're very, very upset about, about you know, the fact that one calls it V4. It's, uh, what, what's it called? It's an, an orphan area that has no function and... So it's typical what, what scientists gets up. Yeah. The focus on the public part of the field is conservative prosthesis. Okay, so A. What, what's sort of not quite fair, this represents, pretty, this represents most of the visual field, while in human this only represents this, uh, a smaller part of the visual field. Just, you can do mapping quite precisely in, sort of in the central part, but in the periphery you can't do it as precisely. So this, so this is not the same. So this, in other words, only encompasses a smaller part of the visual environment compared to the monkey. Now, you're asking me whether the upper visual field is represented more cortical uh, area is represented, is needed for the upper. I thought it was the other way around, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, do you know this answer to this question? But attention is also more. But yeah, so it's a good. It's an interesting observation. Yeah, you're right. Based on this map, it looks that way. It's, I've, 
it's a good point. But I mean, I mean, you, you and you would expect, and I think it's true, as in Patrick also said, that you've got attentional. You can, for example, do more attentional modulation is stronger in the lower part of the visual field in the upper. It makes sense if you, you know, if you go up a savanna where we supposedly evolved. In the upper part of the visual field, there's less interesting stuff because usually it's covered by the sky than in the lower visual part of the field. But, but I agree, there seems to be an asymmetry here. Yeah, exactly. So if you want to find stereo information, you want it, you know, you rarely do things like this. But yet here it's the other way around. Good point. Okay, let's skip that. Okay, let's talk about one particular uh, area because it's one, it's been one of the better characterized and there are some classical experiments that, that I'd like to demonstrate that have been done here. So this area called MT is relatively small. It's maybe like this big, like my thumb. Yeah, it's 50 uh, square millimeter. Lots and lots, if you go to Society of Neuroscience, a meeting with 30,000 neuroscientists, all your best buddies are there, and 20,000 on the order of talks and posters, it's overwhelming. And I sort of, I wax and wane my feelings between sort of being elated and being depressed. Okay. Elated because all these people care about these minutiae that usually you think nobody else cares about. On the other hand, you also feel a bit like, you know, a Dadaist painter that goes to a conference with 20,000 other Dadaist painters. I mean, you think you're unique and only you think of these thoughts and then you find other people who, lots of them. Anyhow, so at a meeting like Society of Neuroscience, you find many sessions just dedicated to area MT and, and associated areas. It's a very hot area. Uh, partly because it can be relatively easy to um, identify. So it's been first uh, seen in post-mortem tissue in humans uh, by the degree of myelination. It has lots of myelin. And so that tells you already, certainly in retrospect, that because myelin, as I said, is involved in making, uh, in speeding up action potential propagation, she might expect, based on that argument, an area that's involved in, in, in fast temporal processing. And indeed, so this is done, uh, uh, here you can focus on do a study, I'll, I'll show in a second what you're using here for stimulus, it's going to be relevant because we're going to, we'll ask you to do this for homework, so you should really pay attention now. There's a part of the brain, this is the front, this is the back, these are various cuts, various slices, this part of the brain here is, is called MT, and it's relatively easy to obtain, I've seen it in my own brain, um, uh, you can see it pretty much in yeah, I don't know any subject. Are there any? Have you ever? Have you ever not seen it? Melissa is one of the cartographers of MT. It's always there. Good, you're showing. Uh, so uh, I mean, th th this is why and this is why brain imaging is so fantastic. You know, I, I I'm dissing it a lot here in in the lecture. On the other hand, where it's fantastic, as you can do before, I mentioned you can only identify this in post mortem in dead people or in the brain of dead people. But now you can take a normal subject and identify the area MT, and then you can tattoo, like one uh, neuroscientist, Nancy Cambridge, has done what you can do. You can tattoo the location of area MT on your skull using blue ink, and then, and then you can use TMS. She's tried to do this. You can then use TM, this transcranial magnetic stimulation to specifically you know, put these, uh, the, the, um, um, the coil above uh, um, uh, onto the skull to try to selectively interfere with, um, with motion processing there. At some point, I thought this was going to be the next rage at, in cognitive neuroscience that everybody would have stuff tattooed onto their skull, but it didn't turn out quite that way. Um, so now I'll talk about some experiments. Like I said, they are very important, and we'll ask you for the homework. In fact, we'll ask you to actually do these experiments yourself, not in a monkey, but in your own brain. And we will not ask you to move from correlation to causation. So what these experiments that I'll now tell you about have shown is the following. A, they relate. Other people have done this also in other areas, but they relate here in a nice quantitative way the firing behavior of individual neurons to the behavior of the animal, and indirectly, therefore, through perception. Right? The only way we can get at perception in, in animals is by, uh, by their behavior. And furthermore, uh, in the second set of experiments, the same group around Bill Newsom at Stanford uh, 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 used kern injection so they can directly bias those neurons and perturb the system and thereby move from correlation to causation. Okay, so in, in, um, in, uh, it, 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 it's part of the, uh, it's, MT is part of the ventral system, the, uh, sorry, the, in the dorsal system, the, the um, vision for action system in the middle temple lobe, that's why it's called middle temple, not motion area, as some people think. And many of these neurons, I mean, this was characterized first by Van Essen and Monzel here, many of the neurons, like 90% plus, are highly selective to motion, they're very sensitive to motion. 
So this part of the brain, if you stick an electrode in, it reacts very reactive to moving things. And for instance, uh, many of them are highly direction selective. So if you def if you discover, so what you do, you know, you have the monkey fixate, and then you move a bow, a stimulus like this, you move it over the receptor field, and you find, drr, drr, drr. if it moves in this direction, it really fires very strongly. If you move it in other direction, it, it, the firing rate falls off. So it's really most strongly in that direction, which you call its preferred direction. And then if you move it in the opposite direction, you, you may get no spikes or one or two spikes. That's a null direction, and they are orthogonal. Uh, they're they're, they're, they're anti-parallel. Okay, so you, what you do, you, you go into a monkey, a trained monkey, you find a, a, a cell, and you find its preferred direction, and you find its null direction. That's the opposite direction. Let me show the experiment that you do, and this is the experiment we'll ask you to do. So this was um, uh, first pioneered by some psychologists, this a motion signal because it's a, uh, it's a relatively m pure motion signal where you don't have any contours. But if you take an edge or move an edge, you have not only motion information, but you also have edge information. So this displays the advantage. There's no motion, there's no edge information there. There's no form information. There's just dots that move. And what, what do you see in this stimulus? Uh, hello? Okay. Wasn't very useful. Hello, what do you see? What? Okay, so that's a random dot stimulus. So here each dot is randomly, there are various ways of doing it. Each dot is basically randomly replotted and has a finite lifetime. In other words, each dot only lasts for 100 to 2 milliseconds and dies, and then another one gets created. But each one moves randomly. So there is no motion signal. This is called 0% coherency. Now what happens here? What's going on? Well, I mean, what do you see? There's no right or wrong answer. What do you see? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here, you have 20% of the dots move in one direction, 80% move randomly. So one out of every fifth point moves, in fact, diagonal. And four out of five points move non randomly, move randomly. And what happens here? Okay, obvious. So, so what you can do now, you can titrate. No, what you can do now, you can titrate the motion signal from zero percent. So, so let's say you've established the cell prefers direction. So now you can titrate the amount of mo motion signal in that preferred direction. You can go from zero when there is no motion signal; they all move randomly, to you know 20 percent, 30 percent, up to 100 percent, where that fraction of dots moves in the cell null direction. Or you can also go negative, negative 100%, that moves all the dots, move rigidly, coherently, as one, into the cell's null direction. So you can, this is a, a parameter you can now vary in a human and monkey experiment systematically. And you can ask, and this is the question we'll ask you in homework, let's, uh, uh, let's give a threshold, 82% for various theoretical reasons. 82%, so I'd like to know for what fraction of dots at this density, of course it depends on all sorts of parameters, which, you, which we'll specify in the homework, so you don't have to explore those. But you know, if you're looking at it directly with your eyes, how many dot, what fraction of dots have to move in one direction, the, the, the preferred direction, say, you know, to the right, in order for you to reliably say, yes, you know, the majority of, or the, the motion signal moves from right to left, and all the others are just noise, right? They move randomly. Turns out to be a small number. I mean, if you really pay attention, it's definitely below 10%. If you're, if you're looking at it. In other words, uh, you can, your brain is good enough that if only a few percent of the dots move in one direction, all the other ones move randomly, you can pick up that signal. And so we'll ask you to do this curve um, for your homework. So, um, and this is a called um, 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 psychometric curve, because it relates this so you can really see the encapsulation. This is where psychophysics originated, using a sort of physical quantitative tools to study perception. Because here you vary a particular physical signal. You, may, you vary the coherency from minus 100% to plus 100%. And you ask people to say, you know, did it? So you have to do what's called, a, uh, um, I guess, a binary choice. You can't say, well, I don't know. Or you can't say, well, I think it moves there. The choice is either it moves to the left or to the right. And you have to tell me, does it move to the left or to the right? And if you don't know, you have to guess. Okay, so there's only two choices, binary choice. That allows you then to plot this curve. 
where where the on the uh, on the x-axis you put the coherency and the y-axis you put the um, the fraction of trials where you correctly predicted that it moved in the preferred direction. So as you saw for 100% or even anything above 30, 40%, it's trivial. You can very easily see it moves in, the, in that direction. Likewise, if it goes to you know anything below uh, minus 25% in the other direction, I mean things are symmetric. You can trivially see it's in the in the opposite direction. In principle, if your brain is unbiased, but that's never entirely true, if your brain unbiased at 0% coherence, remember that's by definition no motion signal, uh, you should be at exactly 50%. Now you might you might be biased. You might you know for example if you if you're doing this by button push, you might you know your right hand might be quicker or bigger or whatever you know so you might you know you might 55% of the time push the button right and only 45% your visual system might be biased. There are all sorts of biases. So people are usually never exactly at 50% at zero, but but close to. And then sort of you have this steep curve, and I don't know here the threshold if you go to 82% is like I don't know 10% or something. Okay, this is called the psychometric curve. Now, oh shit, I forgot a slide. Oh, that's a bummer. That is a bummer. Okay, well, uh, I can draw this. So, um, because now we can do, now what, what, what Newsom did, uh, what Newsom did, he now asked the same question of the, of the cell. So I'm recording now from a neuron, and while the monkey does a behavior, okay, so the monkey is sitting in the chair, you're recording from its brain, you can do that, because as I said, there's no, you know, it doesn't hurt. Um, while you record its monkey's behavior, while it does its task, you record from an area in MT, and you optimize the stimulus for this particular cell in MT. In other words, what you do, you first, with the electrode, find a cell, you discover its preferred and null direction. Let's say, for sake of argument, it, its preferred direction is horizontal to the right, to my right, and its null direction is to my left. And now you, move, you, put the the, you have the stimulus, and you, you, know, you ask the question, you titrate the fraction of the coherency um, uh, in, in one or the other direction. And now you ask the neuron, the, 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 the animal, its behavior, and you get one of these curves. At the same time, you now query the neuron. And so you discover, for example, that for motion in this direction, Let's see, how do I do that? Uh, okay, let's do it like this. So you plot, here you plot the response, how many, so you, wait, you, you, you move the stimulus for two seconds and then the animal has to, has to make its response, has to either indicate by hand or indicate by eye movement where, where it thought the, um, the, 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 the motion signal was in which direction. And then, so let's say you count spikes, you count how many spikes there were over the last two seconds. Okay, so for motion in the, uh, let's say you start off with a 100% coherent signal, okay? So in the, in, the, in the preferred direction, you're going to get lots of spikes. Let's say on average, 100 hertz, 100 spikes over the two seconds. So since it's a random, dis you know, this is random distribution, so typically, this is number of spikes. So if you move in the preferred direction, typically it spikes, you know, this is, let's say this is 100. You know, sometimes it might only spike 80 times, and on the next trial it might do 110. You know, it's a stochastic variable. And if you move it in the null direction, then you see sort of it looks, you know, a little bit like this. This is zero. Obviously, it can't go below zero, so it's biased. But let's see, typically it's around, you know, let's say 10 spikes. 10 spikes. 10 spikes. Okay. So now you can ask mathematically the question. You can use what's, uh, what's called our C curve, receiver operating characteristics, which is a simple mathematical techni technique from um, ideal observer theory, which just uses probability and the assumption that there's an ideal observer that can count spikes and that knows about, uh, about probability distribution. So if I'm now looking in this one trial, I have four spikes. I, I have a very good idea what the signal was. You know, if it's four spikes, it's extremely unlikely to come from this distribution. So with very high confidence, I can say, well, it was a zero signal. Also, on this trial, the neuron spiked 110 times. It spiked 110 spikes. It's extremely likely that the signal was high coherency. Now, this is, uh, let's see, for 100% coherency. So this is minus 100%, and this is plus 100%. Now, let's say I do this for 20%. Coherency, where, uh, which most, which some of you picked up, and well, once you do this a couple of times, it becomes fairly routine. So for 20 cents, things are going to be more complex. For 20 percent, it might the two curves might look like this. So 
you know, on average, in, if you move in the preferred direction, it might spike 50 times, and in the null direction, it might spike, let's say, 30 times. Because now you have all these uh, other signals. So now, if, if, the, if the neuron spiked 80 times, you're pretty sure it's here. If it spiked 20 times, you're pretty sure it's here. But if the neuron spiked 50, like the 40 times, you know, 40 spikes, then, you know, then you're going to be confused. You know, you say, well, I don't know, it could be here, it could be there, and you're, you're going to likely make mistakes. And of course, for 0%, if the cell is unbiased, and again, the cell might also be biased, you know, for 0, they're going to overlay. Uh, overlay. So now you can, you can use this, essentially, and compute probabilities and do it in an ideal observer way, and then you get what's called a neurometric curve. So now you can essentially use this, use this to predict just based on observing the, uh, the, uh, that cell many times, you know, so essentially what you're doing, you're listening to the neurons and saying, okay, it fired very strongly, I predict motion in the null direction, and this time it fired very weakly, so I predict motion in the, in the, sorry, I got it the other way around, you know what I mean. And then you get a curve, well, so the big question is how will the curve look? Well, the curve in general looks like this, this is coherency, and this is, you know, percent response that you get out of this mathematical operation. I'm not making any assumption what the, what the brain can do. I'm just saying, well, I'm counting neurons and I'm putting them into my mathematical machinery. So if C, as I, sh if I said there, if C is very big, like plus 100, you know, I can make the, this decision with almost perfect. This is one. And if it's minus 100, I can, again, make it perfect. And then it's going to be, just like with the behavior, it's going to be some curve like this. Now, of course, you would predict, now remember, well, I mean, what would you predict if you relate, if you, I mean, what do you think the relationship is between the behavior of the animal and behavior of the single neuron? You guys know the answer. What do you think it is? What? <laughs> okay, but here, so here I'm, I'm averaging all one cell, and, but, but, I mean, just generically, one case, we're looking at the output of the entire system. The monkey, you know, the monkey, whatever it does, the monkey comes to a decision. Now I'm querying one of its microscopic variables. I'm just querying one of the neurons. Okay, and so in both cases, I can do these curves. This is called the neurometric curve if we do it for neuron or psychometric if we do it for the animal. What do you think the relationship, if any, between the psychometric curve of the animal versus the neurometric curve for a single neuron? Yeah, what it is. This is a question that's likely to be on your canon this year, incidentally. <laughs> no, I mean, what do you think the relationship? Well, what do you think the relationship is likely to be? Well, it's likely to completely unrelated. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I, for example, pick a neuron in the olfactory system, it's going to be flat, right? No, it's a good point. If I do this uh, for an olfactory neuron, you know, it's going to be flat. It's going to be some firing. It's independent. Okay, but here, remember, I go in an area that I know already from previous experiments is highly motion, and I optimize the stimulus for that particular neuron. So, it, so they're likely to be related. So what do you think the, the nature of the relationship is? So, this link, so that's the relationship you actually drive right there now. Well, this one would be a fictionalized olfactory neon that doesn't care anything about, uh, about motion. Yeah, for example, this is a, you know, it might be like this, or it might be like this. You know, they're, 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 they should be ideally monotonic, and practice often they're not. And what? Well, okay, so, so I guess what I'm asking, what do you think... Let's say you define a threshold here for the neuron, just like before. So let's say you ask 0.82, we're asking the homework, and you ask, okay, what coherency level uh, sees threshold? This is my threshold, and I want to know, if, if, if I, just based on listening to the neurons, I on average want to get 82% of the right answers. What coherency level do I have to, uh, do I have to use in order for, for the neuron to be able to predict that? What do you think the relationship between this value is for the single neuron and for the uh, monkey? In other words, how much better, how much more accurate do you think is the, the behavior of the animal versus the behavior of a single neuron? If you assume it's in both cases are just optimal detectors, either I'm querying the single neuron, how good is the single neuron at, at telling me direction of motion, or how good is the entire animal at, at telling the direction of motion? The neurons should be a little bit better. Well, okay, we rule out any neuron. We, we're just looking at motion-specific neurons. Well, okay, so, so I mean, the intuition... <laughs> okay, my strong intuition, and the intuition of people in the field, is that, of course, neurons are going to be much worse. Why? Because, you know, the, the, the brain has access to the behavior, 
has access to many, many neurons. So in all in individual neuron cells won't be terrible good, but I can pool over many of them, and therefore I can do much better. And I mean, and, you know, this is not just hand moving. You can make this argument very rigorous. It turned out, um, I guess as you sort of were implying, it turns out remarkable that on average, half of the neuron, you could not distinguish, statistically speaking, the psychometric curve of the single cell from the, from the behavior of the animal. In other words, to, so typically the curves look like this, a, a neurometric, and the psychometric curve will also look like this. On half of them, you cannot tell. And on some, they're worse than the animal, and some the cell is, so some the cell is better than the animal, some the cell is worse than the animal. Uh, so this is remarkable because if there are many neurons, you might argue if there are many neurons that do so much better than the animal, well, then something must be corrupt. Then, in other words, there's some neuron that really knows the information very well, but it, the answer isn't, doesn't come out. Now, that could be true, but everybody's expectation is that the brain is optimal. If there's some signal in the brain that really knows about it, the brain will somehow learn to exploit it. So this has been an embarrassment. And now you have to evoke noise and correlation. I mean, there are all sorts of explanations why this might be, which, again, are favorite topics for candidacy questions. <laughs> um, Okay, but, but, but the point is you can make, so the, the point that's relevant for us, because it's a rather artificial task, you know, the monkey has to wait for two seconds and all of that. The point about it, you can make a quantitative systematic relationship between a simple variable, the integrated number of spikes, and behavior. Now, who knows whether the brain can do it, although it, it is remarkable that if you use this mathematics, you can get curves that are very similar between behavior and, 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 and neurons. But the point is, averaging over number of spikes, averaging over spikes in a two-second window, does give you a quantitative relationship to the behavior of the animal, not just sort of hand-waving, but actually quantitative. And it's not oscillation, it's not synchronization, those things don't really seem to matter a lot. In this case, it's, it's just the, the simplest thing, the dumbest thing you can do, you just count spikes over two seconds and put them in relationship to, a, to the behavior and you can get a very nice relationship. Okay, in fact, here you look at, this, is, uh, this shows you the relationship uh, for all the 202 neuro, 212 neurons between the threshold for at the single neuron and the threshold uh, relative to the threshold of the uh, behavior. And it clusters around one. So in other words, ra roughly half the neurons do better and half the neurons do worse. And that was, nobody expected this. Okay, now for the second part of the experiment, what's really important is that the fact that neurons don't randomly, don't occur randomly in the brain, but are clustered. And I pointed this out already in V1. So if you go to MT, it turns out, for example, if you look at direction of motion, where the neurons that respond to this direction, to this direction, to this direction, well, once again, they occur in columns. In other words, if you're in, in this area, and this is roughly, you know, it's a cartoon, it's roughly a millimeter on the side. So let's say for 100 or 150 neuro, um, uh, micrometers, all you're going to encounter are neurons that roughly code for this direction of motion. And then if you move with the electrode over here, they roughly code for that direction of motion. They're not randomly intermixed. Now, what do you think will happen if I now take a current, a wire, and I poke it into the brain, and I inject current? So, you know, let's say I inject current into this column, so I'm going to excite neurons for motion in the upper direction. It is not unreasonable to suppose that... Now, remember, the postsynaptic neurons that look at this area, MT. So let's say the postsynaptic area is called MST. It's another brain motion area. It gets input from area MT. Let's say MST looks at MT and it sees an increase in, uh, in these neurons. These neurons now all fire twice as much. Of course, MST doesn't have an eye outside and can say, well, wait, there's no comparison motion signal outside. All it sees is it gets input from an area MT and sees this increase in motion in this direction. So supposedly, probably, one, one would assume, well, it would signal, oh, there's something moving there, even though there was nothing in the environment and you just happened to, to cheat and put in a, a, a current in there. So that's the... That's what you might expect. In, in this case, that's what, what you do see. The complicated experiments, I don't want to dwell on them, but the, the, the point is you can get a very, again, you can quantitatively shift those neurometric curves. You can get one neurometric curve without stimulus. Now you inject a kernel and you can systematically shift, you get a different neurometric curve, for example, here. And you can quanti so you can quantify, now you can see the threshold that before was, let's say, uh, 20%. Now, with the kernel injection, you know, if you look at the intersection at 82%, it's 10%. So you can say, well, my kernel injection corresponds to adding 10% coherency. 
because in the absence of the current, the, the neuron needed 20% of the dots to move in, in one direction in order to tell whether it's left from right. Now with the current injection, all it needs 10%. So my current injection corresponds to a motion signal of 10%. And it's, it's very, there's a systematic relationship. And furthermore, if you, I mean, you can ask, well, what goes on? What does the monkey actually see? Very interesting question. I talked at length once with a, because uh, I was interested in, 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 before I told this to my wife, and she absolutely nixed this idea in the bud, but the neurosurgeon also didn't want to do it. I, I talked to several neurosurgeons about the idea of doing this myself, where I would identify REMT in, in, uh, in functional imaging, and then have a little bur, a bur hole, and then you, you put a little electrode in, because it's a really interesting question, what do you see? There's several possibilities. One is that if you put an electrode in the brain, you actually see motion without anything. Well, that's a bit difficult to imagine, right? I mean, you know, clearly I can see this moves, but motion without anything, that's a little bit weird. I'll show you in a second the motion after effect where, in fact, you see exactly that. You see motion in the absence of change. So it's, it's not inconceivable. On the other hand, when, when Newsom did this, without any motion stimulus, the animal did not respond. So if there was no motion stimulus, he injected current, it's not that the animal told him there was something was moving. So probably the current that he used, the amplitude of the current was not enough to actually induce a motion stimulus. So it's probably, it's difficult to speculate. You know, maybe the monkey just felt, I don't know, this try I feel it's more likely to be right to the left. And then, uh, and it depends also where, so it depends, it's highly sensitive where you inject. So if you inject current in one particular column, you might only bias in this direction, and in a neighboring column, you only bias neurons in that direction, as you would expect from sort of, you know, this layout. Uh, no, this doesn't work. No, it's, it's, it's horrible interlaced. Because I, I, I wanted to finish with REMT, because you can also get it active during, for illusionary motion with motion after effect, but I don't think this is going to work. Well, let's see. I know this. So, I mean, there's this additional motion signal due to the LCD. Um, it works? Okay, it's not as powerful as a color after effect. We can also see this. Again, this, this uh, interlace problem. Yeah, I see it a little bit. It works very well on the old technology if you have a turntable. Well, none of you will have a turntable. <laughs> but, um, you know, if you still can, it works very well. But particularly if you look at something like your hand or a friend's face, so it seems to, you know, explode at you. And you see activity in people who have done this experiment. Uh, Dave Heger was probably the best version, um, where you can see that even the absence of a physical motion stimulus, area MT is active. So in monkeys, there's a nice relationship between the, between the firing of these neurons and the behavior in a motion task. If you stimulate it, you get a very specific effect in a motion task. It is active. This area is active in, um, in, for motion, as I showed you. That's how you define it in humans. Remember, uh, first I showed you the picture of the, um, uh, the human subject is when he looks at motion. It's also active, albeit somewhat weaker, for illusionary motion. Lastly, remember I talked about the essential node in the, first, uh, in the second lecture, I think? So, this is a, it's a famous patient. In fact, there's two patients. One patient in 1918 after, in Germany after the war, and this is another patient much more recently. She just died. Uh, Ziel is a, 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 a neurologist in Munich, and he described the patient with a bilateral stroke that included REMT. It's not just limited to REMT, but included REMT on both sides, bilateral. And as you can see here, this lady was unable to perceive motion. So she could see uh, things, except that things were very slow. What is possible, and we had a correspondence with, with the neurologist, and in fact, she never saw motion, but if things were slow, she could judge motion because things were far away and then close by. Right? And you can judge by relative parallax or other cues. You can judge, well, it must have moved because it was far away and now close by. She never gave any appearance of actually seeing motion. Um, so what this tells you, this relates to the, 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 the early model I drew that the existence of essential node, the clinical existence of essential node of essential nodes implies that 
that the neuronal correlate for this aspect of consciousness, in this case motion, has to be localized. And if you have a stroke in that area, you lose the conscious perception of motion. You don't lose all visual perception. She had fine stereo and she could do uh, some other, she could do lots of other visual tasks. She just couldn't see consciously motion anymore. And so this really seems to imply uh, this one area. It's one of the best examples where we have uh, pretty good evidence that this area is involved in motion processing. Not only in motion processing, there's also uh, stereo se selectivity there. Like most areas of the brain, it's, it's not this sort of that one area only subserves one function, but it seems to be heavily involved in motion. And if you have lesions in that area, particular large lesions, you will have uh, permanent deficits in, um, in uh, motion perception. Okay, let's leave it at that.